so talking about functional programming basics uh, why why do we do why to do functional programming apart from that reason uh, there are other advantages we'll look at during the course of this talk before we uh, get into the nitty gritties i'd like to talk about a couple of interesting things uh, first one is that there is a curse associated with with functional programming which says that once you understand it you lose the ability to explain it to others and uh, and uh, that's because all the functional programming is very simple to understand it is a bit difficult to comprehend and apply it in practice uh, and that's because the way we programmers are conditioned to think about our software programs in the form of an instruction set and not something more expressive which is what functional programming is and this will be my attempt to break this curse and i hope i uh, i i'm able to share the knowledge uh, but then the question arises is why to learn something that is a bit difficult to apply in practice is it even used in industry and why not to use something more simpler that that can achieve similar results uh, well from job prospects angle you have yourself covered if you know functional la languages we we at thoughtworks use a bit of a lot of scala and a bit of closure uh, linkedin and twitter almost browbeat about their use of scala twitter has their own scala school which is a free course online on on scala facebook famously uses haskell for its spam and fraud detection algorithms and they have a very beautiful uh, blog post on why they chose haskell a pure functional language i'll share that link with you there are a few others uh, like soundcloud akamai atnt etc which, which use functional programming but apart from the job prospects we will we'll see what 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 other things help but let's quickly start with the baggage that comes with learning uh, functional programming <coughs> uh, i promise that this will only be, be the only slide in this presentation which deals with math and and a, and a bit of math never killed anyone uh, always remember that computer science is a branch of mathematics and we are a small planet in the universe that is mathematics so it's it's good to know mathematical underpinnings of 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 functional programming as you can see here we have a, a, a standard high school math uh, we have a domain and a codomain and a function is something that maps a domain of values to its codomain using a transformation i talked about the baggage the second baggage that comes with functional programming is the jargon that is associated with it uh, let's talk about a few so pure functions immutability higher order functions etc these these look a bit scary but uh, what they boil down to at at their very core is having no side effects that's the i would say the bottom line of what we do in functional programming having no side effects and we'll talk about it quite a bit more and and there are many more uh, like monads functors applicatives etc which i won't even touch because i don't know them well enough to explain it to you because they are way out of the scope of this presentation uh and and what i want to claim here and perhaps to the dismay of many functional devotees that you don't need to know all these jazzy words to incorporate functional programming in your day to day work uh you can you can do without them but it helps how you get a shared vo vocabulary with your fellow programmers just like design patterns when you when you tell your teammate that i have done something in factory pattern or a command pattern they get a they get an idea of a high level structure of your code what you have done similarly uh, if you say that you have you have implemented a monadic design for your for your application for your program it helps the shared vocabulary the lingo helps moving on let's let's talk about a few definitions and the origins of functional programming uh in its most basic form functional programming is uh, programming with functions as building blocks duh that's that's like quite simple more precisely it's about programming with pure functions as building blocks now, what are pure functions we'll talk about it uh, soon functional hipsters almost have this religious reverence for the concept of pure functions and it's not totally unwarranted but yeah it's 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 a bit extreme now functional programming is not a new concept 
it it is based on something known as lambda calculus which originated in 1930s developed by a genius called alonzo church what it what it means is given a few set of rules which are rules of lambda calculus any mathematical operation can be composed any mathematical operation can be done and these rules uh, work only on functions your data your values your literals everything is a function and they can be com combined and to form more complex functions and the the mathematical complexity can grow because in 1913 there was no concept called functional programming language there was just lambda calculus another good definition which i like is uh, functional programming is a style of programming that follows certain conventions like one of the jargons we saw like immutability or higher order functions type strictness and they lend some advantage to you another another uh, definition which which uncle bob martin resorts to it's an extremely minimalistic definition which states that functional programming is something that does not use assignment statements very simple that also means that it uses only expressions and it's very important to understand the difference between uh, uh, expressions and statements uh, to define it a statement is a is an imperative programming construct which may or may not return a value and hence might cause side effects like doing io printing to console etc an expression on the other hand uh, although a subset of statement uh, will always return a value and will have no side effects let's let's have a look at an example quickly okay i will cool so uh, a disclaimer again this code is in no particular language it's pseudo code it's created uh, by me it won't compile it is meant to explain the concepts to you so so i won't be compiling any code here but these samples will help you understand the concepts uh, so as we as we can see we have a variable weight of type int which has a value of 50 kg and we want to write a program that gives us a, a comment on the weight a statement way of doing it would be having an if condition and assigning uh, to a variable name comment the value of it 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 has a few drawbacks like assignment to a value there are it's it's not very pretty i would say an expression based in the same language which i have here would be to use a ternary operator which does uh, i'll reduce it a bit more so that it fits better ah so a ternary operator here does nothing extra it doesn't assign any variables it does nothing it just checks on a condition and returns a value expressive there are no there is no scope of any uh, error here so yeah a uh, very important distinction between statement and expression because programming languages will use expressions a lot moving on now now the first uh, few languages that care, that were functional was lisp and scheme in 1950s but with the uh, advancement of uh, imperative languages like fortran and c etc functional languages took a back seat and then recently we had python and ruby uh, small talk and java heralded the age of uh, object oriented programming and everyone thought okay all problems are solved but no they were not and the reason why functional programming is making a comeback now because eric meyer uh, a very great computer scientist he said that we live in an age of crisis of software complexity and distributed large systems have become so complex that a simple procedural object oriented model can't be used to reason about it and hence uh, functional programming paradigm uh, is 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 a very promising solution for that i have shamelessly ripped this this slide from one of the presentation by uh, scott lashin he's a co creator of f sharp language working with my microsoft what this shows is that uh, functional patterns or principles are very different from what we have in object oriented design principles this is a this is a bit bit extreme i would say i mean it's it's not completely accurate but the intention behind this is everything in functional programming boils down to functions that does not mean that there are no patterns in it there are patterns but there are no direct counterparts of your object oriented principles in functional programming Uh, and there is a very good book on this uh, functional programming design patterns in scala and closure i'll share that reference as well so 
important takeaway from this slide is it's a different thinking paradigm. You, you'll have to put a different thinking hat to, to go functional. Cool. Let's let's dive in with the with the concept of pure functions. What are pure functions? For a valid input, there is one and only one valid output. If you have a cosine function, there is no way that it's going to return something else for a cosine of pi. It's always going to return minus one. And when I say valid, it's not something of a business validity, uh, like age cannot be negative, not that. It's validity based on type. So when we define a pure function, it takes something of type string and returns something of type int. That's the only validity the function cares about, the types. Secondly, uh, pure functions don't modify variables out of their scope. They only work on the arguments that they are passed to. Um, in fact, extreme functional programming also is su suggests that we don't have any local scope, uh, local assignments as well. Don't use variables. You just have expressions which are combined to form a return statement. That's it. Like we saw in one of the code examples. In general, uh, functions that cause no side effects are, are basically pure functions. Some advantages of uh, having pure functions. First one is uh, because pure functions don't do anything out of the ordinary, they are very predictable and the results are reproducible. They do something very small in their scope, which is easily understandable. Parallelization is easier because we know Java programmers find it difficult to manage even two threads working on a shared state. So uh, with, with pure functions that don't work on any shared state, parallelization and concurrency becomes easier. Caching or mem memoization uh, becomes easier because you must be knowing in dynamic programming we do this a lot uh, that if an expression is returning the same value again and again we can cache it for uh, next iterations. Uh, in a Fibonacci let's say uh, we want to calculate one, uh, not a Fibonacci sorry, factorial program. Uh, we want to calculate factorial of 10 and after that we want to calculate factorial of 20. We can memoize 10 factorial and then just multiply from 20 to 11. So that, that helps. Laziness, it's, it's, a, it's a hallmark of uh, functional programming. Haskell is an exclusively lazy language uh, where, the, uh, where the evaluation of an expression, even variables, is delayed to the time when it's invoked. And then we can decide whether we want to cache that value or it's a, it's a function which calculates it every time. Okay, uh, referential transparency. It's, uh, referential transparency it, it, it is a tool to gauge the purity of functions. What it means is that uh, the only thing that is important for expressions or functions is its value. And any other expressions that have the same value can be substituted for it. Uh, to give an example, let's, let's, let's go to Sublime back. So, uh, as I give an example of math dot uh, cos, so, so cos of pi, cos of pi is always going to be minus one no matter what platform you run or when you run it. And i square is also minus one, the, the imaginary number. Referential transparency says that the only thing that matters for these two things is its value, which is minus one for the given input, of course, because uh, cos of pi by two will be something else. But cos of pi is going to be minus one and so is i square. And these two are referentially transparent. In a, in, in a complex program, where there are going to be a lot of functions and for a given value functions are referentially transparent they can be substituted for each other. Uh, this, this is a bit difficult concept to digest in the first go but I hope to give some more examples on it. Uh, a quick example of a pure and an impure function. Uh, in this impure function we are passing a string str and we are appending some value to it. We are printing it to console and returning the, the string str. So we are modifying the state of uh, the input arguments to the function. So it's not a pure function. And the pure function on the other hand will simply append a value to it and return. Uh, why this is important is when you're calling that function and you're passing your object to it, you expect that function not to modify the state of your object. 
and if you are if you do expect you'll have to write a lot of tests around it and that that state might might not be in your own control your object's state should be under your control and that's that, that's one of the premise yeah yeah so so that is all the talk about referential transparency and pure functions and uh, and and then then these pure functions uh, can be composed with each other to form more complex programs we will see see its advantages soon talking about the next concept of types uh, types are as fundamental to functional programming paradigm as classes are to object oriented paradigm and types are not classes uh, although types encompass the classes they uh, they um, they include the version of classes uh, to give to give an example an int is a type without a class but a string is a type which has a class of type string that's how it it's it's, it's tied and uh, types are like interfaces uh, in object oriented languages interfaces or pure abstract classes while classes are the uh, concrete implementation of those uh, a, a real world example would be types basically group uh, things of similar nature for example when i talk about a type furniture you might think of a table or a chair but not a car and that that's what type strictness allows it won't allow a car where i am expecting a furniture now uh, there is a, the, there is a caveat in this closure as you might know is a functional language that is dynamically typed so that does mean that type strictness is not mandatory in a, a functional programming language and that's because the underlying lambda calculus comes in two variants uh, typed and untyped but in my opinion type strictness brings a lot of advantages let's let's uh, talk about a few uh, first uh, it provides sanity at compile time it provides understanding at compile time when you are coding for example if you are creating a function that takes an int and returns a boolean it gives a guarantee that this is how it's going to work at runtime uh, unlike ruby where you code and then you run and you come to know okay i have mixed up, messed up the types so it gives a lot of confidence in your programming at compile time next up it helps stopping a lot of uh, bugs that that might leak into runtime at compile time for example uh, if i do an int 5 plus a type dog that's going to blow up at compile time it's not going to go uh, till runtime and it's very important because when you are dealing with a lot of types in your program a lot of objects it 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 brings some respite in thinking that the most common and basic errors are not going to go in at at runtime perhaps the most important advantage is efficiency that is landed at runtime because in type strict languages that, that are compiled <coughs> types are erased at compile time they are not carried at runtime unlike languages like ruby python etc and hence uh, that amount of data is saved and programs act a bit faster moreover in advanced uh, type system like uh, haskell a compiler is able to do some uh, basic uh, optimizations based on type strictness it's a bit bit advanced topic but 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 it helps to know let me give an example of how types might help suppose in in your program which is for an insurance company you have to represent something called age and we know age cannot be negative so you might have to validate that age for runtime validity at all places that you use age with types you can create a new type that does not take negative values at all and then use that type to represent age with that you get rid of all the runtime checks for age that is one and if at compile time you pass anything uh, that is negative the compilation will fail there are very good examples of how you can achieve this in scala and haskell uh, it it helps a lot <coughs> moving on the next concept i think everyone knows about recursion but but it's worth talking about while while discussing basic functional programming uh, and we know that recursion is when a function calls itself time and again in my opinion it has limited advantages it's it its main advantage is that when we recurse we don't mutate any variables even within the scope of the program uh, in a normal loop a for loop or a while loop we have a counter or a or something that is going on in case of recursion that's not not required so so uh, but but when you are traversing trees uh, 
or graphs, I think recursion provides much more concise and elegant code as compared to loops. So use recursion judiciously because the downsides are high. Like uh, a lot of uh, stack frames are created when you when you recurse. Um, if if the depth of the tree or the depth of recursion goes beyond a limit, you might get a stack overflow error, which is what we get all the time. Programming languages like Scala, Haskell give an, give something known as tail call optimization, which at compile time converts those uh, recursive calls to while loops or for loops. But there are some conditions to be met. But but I would say be judicious while using recursion. A, a combination of recursion and looping uh, is uh, uh, used mostly while traversing trees. For example, if, if you want to traverse a directory and list all its subdirectories and children, we pass the root directory, we get its children, and we iterate over the children. If it's a directory, we call the same function again, and the flow continues. So basic recursion, nothing fancy. Ah, one of the most important concepts. Functions as first class citizens and higher order functions. Now in FP, functions are treated as first class objects, just like objects are treated in object oriented paradigm. Uh, what that means is, they can be assigned to a variable, they can be put into a data structure and queued, uh, they can be passed around and passed to other functions, and they can be returned from a function as a return value. That's quite cool. Uh, in object oriented paradigm, you, you have your methods and functions uh, kind of uh, jailed inside your classes. They can't do much. But in functional paradigm, they are quite free to roam about everywhere. It's like democracy. And, <coughs> and, and this, this gives rise to a very important concept that is higher order functions and uh, currying, where we can pass a function to a function and then evaluate that on some argument that is passed. The question arises, why can't I just pass an object to it and that object has methods and then I can, I can invoke those, those methods. Why do I need to pass a function? What is so special about it? I'll tell you, uh, when you pass a function, you decide what the input argument of the function is going to be and what its output is going to be. In case of an object, you are free to add any methods to, to, to that object independent of type strictness and then you might run into some bugs at runtime. So that type strictness, that predictability, that my functions are only going to, uh, to accept a function with certain types for arguments and return, gives a lot of sanity. Cool. Uh, on. Let's talk about higher order functions. Uh, I'll, I'll show a quick example of what defining a first class function is like. A very simple example, I have a variable where var f, not JavaScript again, I have a variable which defines a function that takes an integer and, and tells us whether that uh, number is a odd or even. Kind of. And I can invoke the function by just passing a variable to it. So the type of f in this case is a function that maps an int to a boolean. Oops, I spell bad, yeah. a boolean. So this is the type of that function. And when we assign a variable to the result of the function, its type is int. In case of functional programming, there is no dis distinction between the variable b, which has the type int, and the function f, which has a type int to boolean. Because it does something with that int and returns a boolean. Good so far? Cool. Let's talk about higher order functions. Simply put, higher order functions are ones which accept a function as an argument, rather which can accept functions as argument and return functions as argument, as a result, sorry. And uh, how they help, again I talked about passing objects as opposed to passing functions. Let's, let's quickly look at an example. Here, uh, readable? We declare a function uh, list operations which accepts a list which, which is of type list of numbers int 
And the second argument is don't get perplexed with the uh, fancy syntax there. What it means is it, it takes something which has a name f that accepts an integer and returns an integer. I don't know what it does. I only need a function which takes an integer, does some magic and returns an integer to me. The type, the return type of this function is list of int. What it does is it iterates over each value in that list, applies the function f to it and then returns the result as a list. Let us invoke this function. I, I declare a list called the sum sum list with values 3 to 7 and I pass the sum list to list operations and sorry I hope it is visible. So, basically this is an example of an anonymous function that I am passing which squares the number. I do not care what it does it will evaluate it at runtime and ensure that I get an int at the end. Similarly, I can have a named function f which adds the number to, to itself and I can pass the same named function to that method. A similar example of returning that function, but I think we will look at detail uh, about it in uh, currying. Next up currying with uh, higher order functions. Uh, the official defini definition says that it is a technique of transforming a multi argument function, a function that takes more than one arguments in a way such that it can be called as a chain of functions with either one argument at a time or multiple arguments at a time which does not make much sense to me. But before we look at example I wanted to mention that this, this wonderful concept is named after a guy called Haskell Curry that is actually a guy whose first name is a fun purely functional programming language and the last name is a, a beautiful concept in functional programming. Talk about personification of a, of a, of a guy in, in functional programming I love this name. But yeah, uh, curring is better explained through examples. Okay, so we let's define a function f which takes three numbers, double in this case, and returns its evaluation as x plus y square plus z cube. It can be anything. What curring says that these arguments can be partially applied, and then we can evaluate the function over time rather than having to pass all the three arguments at at once. Uh, in a, in a mathematical form we can say that x y z maps to a function x plus y square plus z cube or it also means that I have a function f of x y z which can be broken down in a function h of x y which takes two arguments and returns a function which takes an int and returns an int. Or it also means that I have a function g which takes one argument and returns a function which takes two ints and returns an int. We will look at an example. We define g of x such that it returns a function uh, with arguments h and z, y and z and then evaluates the argument. What is the type return type of the function g? It is that a function that takes two ints and returns an int. Does that notation make sense? It is it's, it's a function. It is just like a numeric type it is a function. And we do not have to manually do this in most languages. Uh, I think uh, Scala and uh, Haskell have some inbuilt mechanisms which enable currying quite, quite easily. A few more examples uh, if, if instead of 1 we pass 2 arguments to it, then it will return me a function which will take 1 int and return an int. So, the return type of g of x y as opposed to g of x is something that takes an int and returns an int. And how this helps is you might know the input to that function uh, which is just partial you might know one or two of the arguments. When you pass those arguments and get a returned function it caches the values which you already passed and then further down the line when you are actually evaluating it you can pass the last argument and then remembering the earlier arguments it evaluates it. So, it is add the laziness and flexibility of executing functions. Uh, how we how we can call the function. So, if I if I say uh, some function uh, and I pass a number 1 it returns a function which takes two integers and returns me an int. Similarly, to s f if I pass another number it will reduce to a function which takes one int because I already 
passed 1 and 2 to it. So it knows, knows x and y. So it will return me a function which takes an int and returns an int. And finally when I pass the third argument it gives me a number 32. 1 plus 2 square plus 3 cube. I think it's 32. Yeah. So yeah. And there is no difference as far as function programming is concerned between the types and the functions. Good so far? Let's have a look at few examples because too many concepts ruins the day. Let's let's examples. <coughs> So uh, let us say I declare a list and if I want to have addition of all the numbers in the list a simple way would be just iterate over it and do a list. But all functional languages provide a high level functions which do these things readily for us. You, you, you can just say sum of list and it will give it. This is not very useful because even in object oriented you can create a, f a method to which if you passed a list you can get the sum. Advantage here is you can have the sum uh, function generically typed so, so that it can only accept numbers, ints, doubles, etc. and not strings. For strings you might want some other logic like adding strings by putting comma in between etc. So the types help. <coughs> Similarly there are lazy streams or lazy lists in, in, in case of functional programming. I can declare a list, uh, I have called it lazy list here, which spans from 1 to infinity. Now obviously it cannot be evaluated readily because nothing can cook, nothing can hold infinite numbers. What uh, a language like Haskell or Scala does is, it will hold a reference to the stream and not initialize it. It will know that this spans till infinity and when at runtime. I need to do something with it, I can pass, so, so in this case I have passed some variable n and to the take function. What take does is, if I say take 5, it will give me the first 5 numbers from, from the list and which can be determined at runtime. So that, that list although is infinite, uh, at runtime it can pick first n numbers for me and add it for me. So if I pass take 10 to the function and sum it, it will give me 55. This is also a very good example of functional composition. And similarly there are other functions like drop, which will drop first n numbers and give you the remaining numbers. But that will crash your program if you work on infinite lists. So be careful. A few inbuilt higher order functions in, in uh, functional languages, a map function. What a map function does is, it takes a function which is applied to each element of your list or sequence and returns your list of sequence uh, of some other type. Uh, so for example, I say a list dot map, I have a list with some 10 numbers let us say, it again cannot be an infinite list and I map this anonymous function to it. I name each element of it as ELEM and I say just, just square it for me. The return value will be something like 2, 4, 9, 16, etc. I can also uh, return a list of other types. Suppose I want for number 1, it is string representation of O and E for 2 TWO. So that kind of mapping functions I can be done uh, and they can gr grow as much complex as we want. A filter function inbuilt in, in functional languages allows us to retain uh, the entries which pass certain criteria in this example I have created a function is prime which takes a num of type int and determines whether the number is prime or not and I can f I can apply the higher order function filter to the list and it will give me only those numbers which pass the prime criteria. Again a good example of composition of functions and how filter can reduce a lot of boilerplate code in our non-functional languages. I will not talk about reduce I think it is similar but what it does is it, uh, it helps you reduce your list to a, a smallest unit by means of either multiplication, addition, etc. It is fine. <coughs> cool. Uh, again, I do not have any more concepts to talk about. I think these were enough concepts to get started. But let us see some of the advantages of, of functional programming. <coughs> 
easier reasoning while programming. We, we looked at when we, we discussed types that how at compile time unlike Ruby or Python programs you are sure of the constraints that, that your function is going to follow and that gives a very good reasoning and because you can break down your functions in, 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 in smaller chunks and those functions can be composed there is less cognitive overload at a particular moment. You can forget about all other functions in your program at a particular moment and focus on your pure function that you are wor working on. It helps. And of, of course code brevity, we saw the map filter functions etc which take a lot of pain out from looping and all. <coughs> Smaller solution space, we are dealing with small functions, so yeah. Easier debugging, uh, why? Because pure functions do not uh, do anything out of their scope. So when, when you get a defect or, or some issue, you can pretty much zero down to a particular function or a group of functions that might be causing that issue. Also help. There is, this is also, there is also a limitation with debugging which we will we'll talk in the next slide. Cleaner, more readable code because we are using expressions as opposed to statements. The code becomes more concise, smaller as compared to uh, your procedural code. I have seen uh, programs uh, on, on uh, competitive programming websites like HackerRank, HackerEarth, etc., where its Java sol solution is like 50 or 60 lo lines long, while its Scala one is like 7 8 lines long because of maps, filters, reduces. Uh, composition etc. And because uh, functional programming advocates immutability, so uh, in functional programming functions and data are disparate. In your object orientation it says that uh, your classes encapsulate data and the methods that act on it, while in functional programming it says that your functions are just behavior while your data is, is somewhere far away an immutable object that functions do not care about what their data is. Once that data is passed to the functions, they will do something and return you a value, but functions do not do anything with, uh, with creating the data per se. Better modularization, reuse because, uh, because you do not have 10,000 line classes, we generally have fewer functions per file. It is equally easy in functional pro programming to bloat your programs. But it, but it helps when you have smaller functions that can be easily tested. Sharing data due to immutability, yeah, perfect. So to give an example, if you have a list that, that's, that stores 1 to 1000 numbers and that is immutable both the reference and the object itself and somewhere else you need a list which is like 1 to 200 let us say, your program will itself share the part of that data with the other part of the program because it is safe to do as there is not going to be any uh, threads talking to it. It is going to be immutable throughout the life of the program. And of course uh, mapping, filtering, reducing and folding functions are, are way cooler than looping. They, they look amazing. But uh, of course there are also some downsides. I mean it is not all rosy in the functional land. <coughs> uh, functional programming tends to be theoretically very ideal and it, it says that uh, okay I have these pure functions and all my problems will be solved, no because real world programs have to do side effects, they have to talk to databases, they have to do IO or print to console. Uh, FP resorts to some hacks to get around these uh, things. For example, Scala Z is a library uh, that accompanies Scala which, which gives capabilities of doing IO without mutation. But those are more of hacks. What that means is a practical functional language might not be purely functional and, and hence it is like, uh, it's, it's like pure mathematics and physics. We need to pick, cherry pick uh, good parts of functional programming and uh, introduce in, in our day to day language rather than going purely functional like, like Haskell. Uh, yeah, uh, functional concepts are a bit difficult to grasp, especially to those who are beginning programming and I personally do not advise anyone beginning a programming to pick up a purely functional language because, because of the baggage that comes with it and, and that particular person might take time 
to actually code and get their hands dirty and, and which might discourage them. And you know that is not because uh, FP is way difficult that is because of the way we are conditioned that is because of the way the real world problems are they are tend to be procedurals and while we model them in, 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 in functional paradigm it, it becomes a, a difficult it is a there is a disconnect there. <coughs> Laziness although a virtue in many situations uh, it makes it difficult to gauge the time and performance benefits of a program because you do not know when your function is going to be evaluated or your variable is going to be initialized. In, in, in case of strict execution model as soon as a variable is referred to or a function is invoked it will be evaluated that helps uh, testing per performance and time and complexity needs. <coughs> Yes, so this is what I, I was talking about when I said that debugging is equally difficult in functional languages because of the nature of it. Uh, for example, I think I have an example for this. <coughs> so, uh, if I have a list and I am ma mapping over a list, it actually does not make sense to put a breakpoint there. I mean, it is going to it's it's an abstracted way of executing the loop within the map function so it doesn't make uh, sense to put a debugger there what we as functional programmers do is put print statements in between which prints the execution of each map function again it's it's resorting to hacks but but most functional programming don't have breakpoint like debugging techniques yes uh, functional programming tends to be a lot of lot intensive on memory and uh, cpu because of the infrastructure that is needed to support functional programming uh, including laziness etc. Uh, that is why it is also very difficult to get to code functionally for hardware or for high performance games because, because functional programming programs tend to be memory intensive. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, suppose you want to mutate a piece of data in functional programming what it says is do not mutate the same data create a whole new data structure copy it and with the new uh, parameter you want to add or removing what you do not want. So, that is quite memory intensive and hence I think C++ and C are not going anywhere anytime soon as far as high performance games or browsers are concerned. Uh, Firefox made this uh, rust language which tries to bridge the gap, but it is far from perfect. And last but not the least functional programmers tend to be snobby because they think they are coding in something supremely pure divine thing and sometimes I have seen they resort to solutions which are way more difficult and less readable than, than can be done in a simple uh, procedural, uh, procedural way. So, yeah you will you will meet some of these if you code functionally. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thank you.